Well, we are going to go ahead and get started with our 32nd Conversations with CAG-T. Uh, we started this about nine months ago, and um, we are um, really excited to actually have a return guest this evening. Um, but first, I want to remind everybody um, that we still are um, accepting registrations for our virtual conference that we held in October. You still have access to all of the sessions and all of the great speakers and information that we shared and that was shared during that conference. Um, so please go to our website and check that out. Uh, also want to mention that this is the last week to register students um, in ninth through 12th grade for our legislative day. Again, this year it will be virtual as there's so many other things, but I'm really excited for the platform and the program that we'll be using and some of the great breakout sessions that students are gonna be able to attend that are targeted toward their interests. I've got a few students of my own going and we're really excited to um, share in that day with them. So if you have not reg registered your student yet, um, have your student log on to our website, click on legislative day. The process is really quick and painless and we'd love to have your, your student or your child join us um, in February for legislative day. Um, so tonight we have Dr. Norma Happenstein with us. She um, was in a session uh, with me a while ago, I think back in October or November. Um, and we tonight are welcoming two um, other individuals from um, Colorado schools. We have Dr. Merrill Faulkner and she's the gifted and talented coordinator for Denver Public Schools. And then we have Dr. Ryan McClintock. He's an administrator and gifted facilitator in Douglas County. Um, and am I correct in saying you both went through Merrill's doctoral or Norma's doctoral program? Yes, that's right. Okay, yep. all right. So they are, they know each other well, I'm sure, as you do get to know. Um, one another when going through those advanced degree programs. So tonight we're going to just have a really fun kind of back and forth uh, dialogue and question and answer session. Um, we will preview those questions for you so you can see as an audience what's going to be coming up in the conversation. Um, but we want to encourage you as you are watching and listening to put your comments and questions in the chat and we'll make sure we have opportunities to get to those questions at the end of um, our discussion tonight. So welcome um, Ryan and Merrill and Norma to, to Conversations with Cacti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. It happy is to be here. a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. As Randy is, is sharing her screen, we wanted to just uh, again, say thank you for the opportunity to uh, to CAG T for um, providing this kind of support to our community at large, and we're really pleased to be able to be here today. Thank you. Our our focus this evening is really um, about the importance of gifted education leadership, and um, the the three of us together have generated some questions that we thought might be of interest. Um, I'm looking forward to this because I get to ask the questions mm -hmm. and doctors McClintock and Faulkner will be answering the questions. So um, I'm looking forward to this uh, tonight very much. And we wanted to just quickly share with you a, a brief overview um, of the questions that um, we'll be talking about. Everything from, from why is gifted education important? Um, some of the main issues in the field right now maybe some challenges that families might be experiencing, how to best advocate um, for your child. Um, and, and then we wanna wrap up, of course, with vision for the future of gifted education. So um, I'll be talking about each of these questions and um, asking both Ryan and Meryl to respond to each. So thank you, Randy, for putting those up for us. So I, I think it's important for us to, to think about um, as we begin our conversations this evening about the why. Why is gifted education important? And those of you that are in the audience, I'd encourage you to try to answer that yourselves as well as we listen to our colleagues. Meryl or Ryan, do you wanna begin? Sure, I'll start. So thanks again for having us. I know Ryan and I are both excited to be here and engage in this conversation. When I think about why gifted education is important um, and having 
been a classroom teacher in the past, I know that it's just so important uh, for all students to have their educational needs met, regardless of the curriculum um, or, or the teacher or you know the district, the, the state standards, that students get their educational needs met. Um, and that comes back to allowing students to have the opportunity to fulfill their potential. Um, and so thinking about gifted education, it, it really comes down to being a civil rights issue and giving students the opportunity to meet their potential um, without discrimination and, and really ensuring that we're giving teachers the tools to do that and to differentiate appropriately. What do you think, Ryan? Yeah, I am. Um... I mean, I, I start by thinking about if, if we agree that we're fundamentally here to, to, to really kind of uh, our underlying premise is to nurture students and guide students, inspire students, and like you said, kind of meet their needs, then, you know, uh, the moment that we actually start, I, I kind of start thinking about lesson plan, lesson design, um, a lot of the high school teachers I work with, the idea that they start to pace out their lessons and they start to kind of think that out. And the moment they actually kind of engage that way and say, this is how long this lesson is going to take and this is the avenue we're going, then you have outliers. You know, you're going to have students who, that might be a little bit too quick for them. And you have some students who already know what you're gonna say um, and may already know that particular material. And when we are there to meet their needs, um, uh, then I think that we actually need uh, specialized training uh, to do that. And, and, and that's where the fundamentals of gifted education uh, come in. Um, the idea of you know words like challenge and thriving. And what does that mean? A grade might not say it all. Um, uh, a grade might not uh, definitely paint the, the right picture there. Um, the idea of how are you assessing students? How, how do you know what they already know and what are you gonna do um, with that information? Um, I, I kind of echo some of the information that I think is on uh, from CAGT and, and AJC on their websites in terms of uh, the data, in terms of how students respond um, to, uh, to programming that's available for them to actually re meet those needs um, and differentiate, um, not just the content, but certainly the process along the way. Um, I, you know, I think, Another word I want to throw out there is really kind of, you know, uh, stimulating the thinking um, and then connecting with your students. Thank you. Thank you both. One of the things that I've, I've heard um, discussed over and over again is that we as um, holders of the system should not impose limits on what kids can learn. And um, I just reinforce um, what Meryl just mentioned about a civil rights issue. Um, our job is not to make children wait um, all day long um, or having to spend time with things that they already know. You know, this in a related way, um, sometimes um, we recognize that many educators aren't trained in gifted education and they come into the, the field thinking of that um, they know what gifted kids are, and oftentimes that's a belief around giftedness um, rather than actual uh, professional learning around giftedness. What, what happens when we don't have educators that really understand gifted children and their particular needs? I think that's a, a really good question, and I know something that Ryan and I have um, experienced and can speak to. Um, and I just want to say that it's not the teachers fault if they haven't been trained. Um, it is a rarity that teacher prep programs include training in gifted education. And so that's something that we need to think about um, for anyone who can advocate for it to really push for gifted education training in teacher prep programs and in master's programs, um, et cetera. And so when, student, when teachers are not trained, um, like Norma said, it comes back to what the belief of giftedness is, um, maybe what that teacher's experience was when they were growing up or um, ha have maybe had a chance encounter with a student that, that was gifted, um, but it may not be relative to how do I appropriately differentiate for this student or students, um, regardless of label. Um, many times you will have gifted students in your class that are not um, identified that doesn't mean they don't deserve the differentiation, right? So it's making sure that you can meet the needs of those students regardless of label. Um, I think a, a challenge that I run into is um, because of lack of experience, some, some teachers will argue whether or not giftedness itself exists 
And so coming back to the idea that the, the gifted kids will be okay. They already know what I'm going to teach. They're gonna be fine. I need to focus on my students who need extra help. Um, and of course, we want to meet the needs of all the students in the class. Yes, we want to, to give the students who might need an extra help or push that extra help and push, but also the students that walk into the classroom that already know your entire math curriculum, what will we do for them? Because it's not okay for them to sit through the same lessons that they understand. And so um, the challenges I think are just trying to break through some mindsets on really what is giftedness and how to address it in the classroom appropriately for students. Yeah, I, I think you you both made some amazing points there that I, I kind of want to reiterate. I, I, a few minutes ago, Norma, you talked about, um, I guess I'm going to sum it up as like wasted time. Mm -hmm. um, or time, idle time. Um, and, you know, I, I can speak anecdotally just working with uh, high school students. Um, when we have established a relationship and they'll come in and kind of close the office door and sit down and uh, talk about what it's like to kind of be in certain classes and they have the utmost respect for their teachers. Um, and, but, but oftentimes they'll stop and then they'll, they'll kind of read something off to the side and they'll spend it, they'll spend upwards, you know, 25, 50% oftentimes of a class period, just kind of doing something different or they may ask, be asked to, help other students along the way, um, which, uh, you know, every now and again, it's kind of a noble thing to do, um, but it's not always engaging um, these particular students. And sometimes they feel bad if they were to say, well, no, can I do something different? Um, I think with the, and I also, Mara, what you're saying, like, I mean, you know, we, we all want to be effective, right? And we all want to be impactful. Um, and we want, we all want to be um, relevant in, in our students' lives. And, and so we certainly don't blame, I don't blame my colleagues. Um, they don't have the training. Um, and I remember the first time I received training, I was a brand new teacher out in California. And for, I was very, very fortunate. I was taken under a wing and I went actually through some special ed training. Um, and I didn't know how impactful that was going to be in my career all the way through um, now 20 some, odd, 20 some odd years later. I, I think with a lack of training also comes uh, misunderstandings um, that might kind of grow into myths. Um, the idea of kind of well-roundedness, the idea of they'll, they'll be okay. Um, uh, I, I also think that without the proper training, then we might just increase the volume of work. Um, I have some students sometimes that, that don't always want to go talk to their teachers because they're just afraid they're just going to get more, more copies um, of something to do rather than kind of complex or, or, or richer opportunities to kind of dig in. Um, I think ultimately it, it can be without training, I think you can get like a swing and a miss, a conflict even might arise. Um, uh, over some disagreements. I think with twice exceptional students, I think a deficit may be focused on entirely um, and then completely missing um, strengths and gifts and talents along the way um, without proper training. Um, and so, I, and then in high school, oftentimes when you do have a, a teacher either through training or just through um, empathy or personality or natural ability or content knowledge, um, they might be uh, connecting um, with, with a lot of our gifted and talented students. Then all those students end up kind of funneling into that one class. Um, and, and so you just kind of get one pathway with maybe one particular teacher. Um, and, and, and I think that that can also um, uh, be an issue um, across the board when you think systematically. But I, I just think with a lack of training, um, then you're, there's just lack of connecting um, and a lack of development. You know, one of the things that I um, have seen um, happen is that, that it's a it's a joy and a challenge of education. Um, we can always do more. We can always learn more. There's always another opportunity. And um, I mean, I, I've seen even in recent years, tremendous developments around uh, uh, concepts related to differentiation and certainly around social emotional learning. Um, things that perhaps we didn't consider previously as well as brain-based strategies or culture of responsive pedagogy. There's all kinds of things um, that are continuing to develop and grow over time. And I, so I'd be interested in hearing a little bit, and I know Randy, you, you were gonna ask a question. I, I just, I feel like as questions come in that are pertaining to what you're saying, I feel like it is more organic to kind of just interject and see if- Sure. Expand upon that. Um, with the lack of training for general ed in gifted ed, I mean, we all know uh, when we went through our teacher training programs, there was very little on gifted education. Um, how, uh, Kimberly, um, 
and I, I, I'm going to not say her middle name correctly, so I'll say the last name, Kimberly Kaplan, um, says that with the lack of training for general education, how do you recommend we approach this time funding quality of PD? Should we ad advocate at the legislative le level like folks did for culturally, linguistically diverse and, and special education? Is that is that kind of the steps that we would need to take? I mean, and maybe as parents need to take? Boy, I would absolutely support that. Um, if you think about how change happens in educational systems, it's often driven by parents. And, and um, there can be suggestions for um, uh, change and action, but if there is the opportunity to pursue that at the legislative level and have that change occur so that there are clear expectations with clear accountability, um, that really is the way that that needs to, to happen. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Kimberly, for raising that issue as well. Um, and frankly, um, there's some lessons learned there um, around um, um, different kinds of opportunities um, and opportunities for, for more professional learning as well. Maybe um, Meryl and Ryan could share some things that um, that you learned that you didn't anticipate you were going to learn. I, I know that happens to me every day. Something new that comes out of my um, own opportunities for education. What were some things that you learned yourselves related to gifted education in, in your graduate training? So I just wanted to add on to what we were just talking about as well, um, as far as teacher training goes. I know in Denver Public Schools um, in my district and, and several others in the metro area that we are offering a series of professional development courses um, for teachers to get internally district certified in gifted education. And that's one of the ways that, that we're trying to push out more information to teachers um, in a more systematic way. Of course, gifted teachers can and do lead PDs um, at the school level and we have district trainings and of course other districts have their own um, GT PD days, but that's another way that we're trying to um, kind of pick up the slack where teachers are not getting that PD um, and actual coursework um, in every teacher prep program. Um, but to move on to your next question, I think the most notable thing um, that I learned in my uh, EDD program outside of just really being immersed in the research process and what that all looks like uh, and pertains to, but it's um, it's how the gifted brain learns, um, which is the name of David Sousa's book. And I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in, in really finding out how the gifted brain works because it's a, it's a way to um, talk about giftedness uh, with some scientific fact based on brain research. And I know sometimes people get hang up hung up on the word gifted because it can, to some people, it doesn't feel good. It feels like, well, if, if this kid's gifted, this kid's not gifted, like what are we trying to communicate through this word? And so it gives a way to talk about giftedness um, through actual brain research on how the brain develops and what's different about um, students who are gifted uh, and to kind of take away the label from it. So it's not some subjective word that that I'm just making up and talking to, to a teacher about. No, this is actual factual research. Um, this is how the brain works. And that um, having a better understanding of how the brain works helps teachers understand a variety of ways to differentiate that will help students in the classroom. Not just teachers, perhaps, but legislators as well. Absolutely, legislators, yeah. parents, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Right, so I, I uh, hmm. To say I learned a lot, I, I, um, I think I'm just going to kind of boil it down to the fact that almost everything I was kind of encountering and bumping into, um, I was almost able to turn it around immediately and really start to kind of uh, put it to use. I just happened to be in, in uh, as a teacher, but also uh, in certain positions in my school that I think I was able to, to, to kind of implement a lot of the ideas. I think one in particular that I think left a pretty lasting uh, and immediate impact was the idea of asynchronous development. I, I think that hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, it just suddenly explained um, a lot of uh, my experience, a lot of uh, the students I've worked with, um, and it kind of coupled nicely with, I think, the concept of intensity. 
um, and really how to um, uh, respect and listen to students and also their families. Because I mean, Norma, it was, I think in one of our very first classes, I think it was a summer class um, when we were you know, moving along at a pretty brisk uh, clip there and, um, and had the opportunity to interview. Um, uh, the student was, was too busy um, basically uh, solving the mysteries of the universe um, with allegedly NASA, but I was able to, uh, to, to interview a mother of a profoundly gifted student and uh, really just listen to her story and the idea that at different schools and uh, acceleration and, and when there are certain people right in, in, in her life and uh, her son's life to kind of properly advocate and, and thinking that, you know, I'm so thankful for that, but we, we need to do better. Um, it, 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 can't, it can't just be because they just happen to, you know, fortuitously bump into someone or hear about someone. I think um, these collisions need to happen more purposefully. And, and so I really started to kind of think about, I wondered about how many students we, and families we just aren't connecting with, how many are just saying, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and homeschool and, and, and go a different route um, and really how lonely and isolating that might feel um, uh, for some of the families along the way. I, I started to think more about policy. Um, Kimberly asked a good question and Norma, you addressed it in terms of, I think the goal would be that, that state level policy and that's something that, that really um, resonates with me. And then, um, but I also started thinking about the reality also of Kimberly's question in terms of like funding and personnel and whatnot and saying, okay, well, in this position, what can I, if I, what have I learned here that I can still kind of express to my colleagues and know that um, something that as, as a staff or as a larger system, they can still incorporate um, and connect with all their students, but especially their gifted students and start to kind of really roll that in just to whatever position um, I happen to be in at that time. And knowing that the ultimate goal is to, is to create that kind of larger scale um, systematic change at not only the state level, but um, it might come up a little bit later, but maybe beyond that uh, would be wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I mean, an example of that would be uh, just the idea of, you know, high schools are busy places. And I mean, there's a couple of years I'm running around just every time I'm evaluating a teacher, working with the teacher, I'm talking about PGA. I just needed an acronym, PGA, because I knew if we talked about pre-assessment, um, uh, the idea that they're doing it, but what are you doing with uh, your pre-assessment and, and how can you make you actually design that a little bit more purposefully? How, how are you grouping students um, and how do students know that they're being grouped? Um, and then the A is I needed something to kind of make it sound cool, but really the A is for like acceleration, which really would be differentiation, but just kind of maintaining those conversations um, and knowing that they are having some type of an impact, albeit soft. Um, but yeah, the, the advocacy was, was something that um, definitely was a theme throughout this, uh, this entire graduate experience as I continued to kind of learn uh, more about gifted learners and, and some of the, um, the ideas that like, you know, Meryl mentioned. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the neurobiology um, of the brain. So you've all, you've mentioned really um, important issues um, already, but, but what do you think some of the main issues um, that, that, are, that, are, that we're facing in the field today? And those can be either, you know, as specific as an individual classroom, all the way up through, um, you know, perceptions of, the purpose of education or, or um, um, issues around, around the value of, of acceleration and um, differentiation for gifted learners. What are your thoughts about those issues and what might we do? So um, for me, my passion is really identification of gifted students and it's what my research is based on. So increasing equity in gifted education um, representation and identified students from underrepresented populations is um, a huge issue in the field, right? Not only right now, it has been for a long time. Um, and I feel like uh, we're at a point right now where there are more districts willing and able to address it. Um, I am fortunate to work on a fantastic team at DPS where every single day equity is the lens that we are looking through and we are constantly looking for ways to um, improve our systems. We are looking over the state law, the ECEA on what, how do you identify students and make sure that that aligns very clearly with what we are doing at the district level that um, is not putting more barriers up for students from underrepresented populations. Um, so beyond that, 
just identification and increasing equity. We need better teacher training for classroom teachers to recognize giftedness across a variety um, of cultures, backgrounds, ethnicities. Um, because white and Asian students have largely been overrepresented in gifted education, that's the lens that many classroom teachers are looking at when they're looking for giftedness. Now, uh, not to say that those students don't deserve to be identified gifted. However, there's a huge discrepancy in representation from our other populations. Um, so we need to put a focus on making sure that teachers are understanding uh, what to look for, what their own personal biases may be, and how that can influence um, recommendations for gifted education. Um, looking at what about multi-language learners? Uh, how does giftedness show up um, when you're learning several languages? Um, and then moving on to how do we communicate with families about gifted education? Um, this is a huge thing that came up in, in my research was that um, people that knew about gifted education were those who had experienced it um, as a child. And so uh, that's not okay that that's the avenue of, of, um, of knowledge that people are coming with. We need to make a very purposeful effort at the district level to communicate um, what gifted education is, what is identification? What is programming? Um, how, how does this process even start? And so um, that's something that, that teachers can help advocate for as well, and also parents to, to continue to ask questions. Um, and I know we're going to get on to a different question. I can expand a little bit further about um, how families can get involved. Thank you, Meryl. That's a direct lead into the idea of agency with Ryan. So, yeah, I, I mean, wow. Did you guys practice um, this? I want to know. <laughs> you may have you read know. his research. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I'm going to choose to uh, try to follow up uh, Meryl's wonderful response. Um, and then kind of through the lens of, uh, of, of, of high school and secondary, um, and then maybe include some initiatives I'm pretty proud of that are happening and um, in my district with some of our, our, our leadership there as well around these. I think, um, I think start off by saying that, you know, uh, schools that are fortunate enough to have robust uh, advanced placement um, and international board, uh, baccalaureate diploma programs. I mean, that, that's wonderful that those programs are there for, uh, you know, accelerational diploma program is a little bit more of kind of a holistic program. But the idea that I believe, um, last time I was checking that those programs, especially AP is, in, is a, has increased, I believe, like, um, almost like ninefold over the past seven years. Um, and what are the implications of that? And, and I think what may be happening is the idea that we are, we are just bringing in these wonderful programs. Yeah, these accelerated classes, but just kind of relying on them um, as our gifted programming exclusively. Um, and then what is that addressing, but what might that be missing? Um, and so that's, that's something that I'm uh, particularly kind of interested in at the high school level. Um, the idea, I have one of my students actually in an AP class who, who's doing an entire research study on social emotional kind of drain and stress of being um, uh, a, a, a gifted and accelerated uh, learner in a high school and what that's like. And um, the idea of a autonomy um, in schools and what does that mean and how does that manifest in a term that we're seeing quite often now, that, that idea of agency, um, that idea of kind of some empowered choice um, which is more than just saying, here's a list of five things, please choose one of those five, and I, I just gave you agency. Um, I, I, I'm not giving a student agency, but I, I'm, I'm not getting in the way um, of the student actually um, uh, influencing uh, the work in the class and expressing um, their ideas, and in some cases, their curiosity and their process and their thinking, and how in high schools can we actually create programming and, and experiences like that, either in individual classes um, or interdisciplinary classes, or um, some type of um, opportunity where students are able to contribute um, to the actual functioning of the school um, and really connect nicely with their, their very local uh, community. Um, and at some level that, that, that does compete um, with, with some of those other classes that are there. Um, but I think that that's something that we should re-engage with, um, that idea of uh, uh, classes you know, that aren't necessarily just accelerated. Um, but rather the students are going to contribute throughout the way. Um, I, along those lines, um, you know, Mary, you're talking about like identification um, and, and so many of those um, crucial, I think, topics 
in terms of how students are identified and then how are they, um, how, do we, how do we support students once identified? And one of the things that I'm uh, talking about with my colleagues in my district are the vertical transitions um, from elementary school to middle school and then from middle school to high school and how can we actually target those transitions as times to really re-engage with um, the advanced learning plan process in the state of Colorado? Um, how might it be different at that next level um, and, but how can we, rather than just kind of get through the transition and move on like nothing's happened, but how can we actually um, use that time uh, to re-engage with the student, the process and the family? Um, and then uh, also th that uh, folks in my district are really kind of starting to scrutinize um, data in terms of who's taking AP courses and other courses uh, through the umbrella of equity of access um, and what that data may yield that uh, might be similar to the identification um, disproportionality that you were kind of talking about, Meryl, um, but I'm excited um, that that work is happening and really looking forward to seeing how it might impact all the way through K-12, um, but especially in the high school years. Excellent comments um, from both of you. Thank you. I mean, you're describing issues that, um, that are pertinent um, to our, our families, our, our students, our, our communities at large. Um, and at the same time, uh, we, wanna, we wanna recognize that sometimes the challenges are experienced by families in working with the schools and how can we help support families to, to advocate for their, for their children, to advocate for their students to receive the kind of um, education that they see is appropriate for them in the school setting. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on, on challenges and then strategies to advocate. Um, you know, how does, how does that work um, so that, that parents can feel effective in supporting the needs of their students? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, considering challenges that families might face, I think initially what I was just talking about, just having access to information um, about gifted programming at the school and at the district level, that can be a challenge, especially um, when families haven't uh, been a part of gifted education and then they are trying to seek that for their children. Uh, what, that, what does that really look like and how do they access that information? Um, I think also it's important to consider um, achievement versus ability. Um, so thinking about how for a long time people have considered giftedness as being students who are achieving at, a, at some standard high level and that is not always the case. Um, and it is also about uh, a student's ability, their cognitive ability. And so when you have a student who is underachieving, but has a very high cognitive ability, it becomes difficult for a family to, um, to navigate how to advocate for that child in a way that is gonna meet their needs. Um, so I would just say first to, to really seek to be a partner with your, with your school's teacher, um, and the school itself and, and to come in with an open mindset that, that people, um, to have that assumption that people really are doing the best that they know how to do um, and to, to try to seek a partnership um, first with your, with your students, uh, classroom teacher or subject uh, level teacher that you're seeking more support. Um, and then, you know, to partner with school leadership to have an understanding of what programming is available, um, how to get more support for your student but to really come from a place that everybody at that school and, and yourself included, they're all working together um, to help meet the needs of your child and, and to really be patient and understand that, that all students are different, right? All gifted students are different and, and the needs that need to be met, it'll be different. Even if you have two gifted children, you know very well that their needs are very different. Um, so I would just say, come in with an open mind, seek to get as much knowledge as you can um, from, from the, the every level, from the teacher, from, from the school admin, and then even onto the district level uh, about what supports are available, how does gifted programming and identification work, um, and to really go through that avenue first. Um, what do you think, Ryan? Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking, um, getting to the idea of the families, but also kind of thinking about um, with within a district or within a school, um, what can be done um, to really kind of build the capacity and the tolerance for these conversations um, to benefit gifted education, gifted learners. I, I think um, 
moving past the they'll be all right um, uh, stage when things get a little bit uh, kind of uh, fuzzy or cloudy, especially in the busyness of schools, I think it's important to consider the, the, the roles that, like in a high school, the roles that are already there. You, you, you certainly got your classroom teachers and your content areas. Um, not to be overlooked are your counselors. Um, counselors are incredibly important people and, and, and um, ever increasingly important uh, in, in, in the lives of high school students, uh, not just there uh, to, to actually uh, interact with the students and, and counsel them, but also through the registration process. Um, and so for those in the position, like say centrally, um, who, who are uh, able to do some training to, to include um, the counselors as part of that conversation um, to, to help them understand um, uh, gifted education and then also, um, and you build up that capacity. I mean, in high school, you might you might be fortunate enough to have one facilitator at a school with a couple hundred students um, that are identified, and that's certainly not going to happen alone. Um, and so, you do need to build up a team around you, and you might want to consider your your department chairs and other folks. Um, uh, you might want to take a look at red, the registration process and the scheduling and the idea of hand scheduling all in a way, um, and uh, having a mindset to kind of working a problem uh, towards a solution. Um, and uh, not just uh, you know throwing out a no answer if something sounds a little bit kind of uh, different, especially if a student threw out that potential solution for uh, should I take this class instead of this class or can I do this um, instead? Um, I, I, I think also in kind of getting into the idea of, of families and parents, I, I, when, when we are kind of focused on kind of building that capacity and structure within the schools, then for, for a parent to know who, who to potentially contact, um, it might be the principal um, if, if you're not sure, but sometimes there's there's an intimidation factor um, in terms of how do I reach out? And I think that intimidation factor is real from, from parents contacting the teachers and certainly teachers contacting parents. Um, and um, But the ability to kind of uh, make that personal connection and, and have someone on the inside to start working with, and that could be um, a facil someone in the GT facilitator role it could be a counselor, it could be an administrator. If the school is fortunate enough to have like an advisory or advisement type program, um, and then that's someone that's really important too. Um, but for a family to be able to connect um, uh, with someone who, when they've got questions, they can reach out um, to start that conversation. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, schools often can feel like, to use the scientific analogy, like a black box. Um, the idea that, you know, uh, whatever's in the inside is not experiencing whatever's on the outside. There's just no transfer. Just, you know, students can, you know, in normal times go to the school and, and we'll take care of your student, but leave them alone a little bit. Um, but it doesn't just happen like that. Um, uh, if parents have questions, they should be able to kind of reach out to the point of contact, but then ideally at the high school, the ability to be, to, to be empowering the students um, to, to seek answers to those questions as well and then communicate those um, uh, along the way to their parents. Um, that's something that I've seen some, some success with over the years. But I, I just can't get around the fact that this is a, a business of people, right, um, that we're in and, um, and we just have to embrace that. And it can be messy, um, but, <laughs> but I think we're all there for the right reasons. You know, you're, you bring up some, some really relevant points. And I, I think about um, that there's a, a piece of research that, that talks about what's the most important thing for successful acceleration. Um, and and we, we talk about that in classes. And so just think about that a minute. What's the most important thing for successful acceleration? I've had students say, oh, it, it's the content or it's the pacing or it's, um, it's, it's something related to, um, to the system. But in fact, the most important thing for successful acceleration is someone who's advocating. So it's someone who's um, providing that support and, and, and walking beside the student. Um, and so all of the things that you all are describing are really uh, strategies for collaboration to, to provide the best service for the, the child directly. So I, I really appreciate your, your comments and, and thoughts related to that. What, what kind of advice would you give to families um, um, directly on how to, how to support um, working um, on behalf of their, of their children? And, and where can they go to get more information? So I just want to add on to the relevant topic of acceleration that you just brought up, um, which can be a challenge that families face um, because right now, and I am speaking from an elementary middle school level, 
at this point, more elementary. Right now, acceleration is not as normalized as it should be. And so it becomes tough when, and not all gifted kids should be accelerated, that's not what I'm saying, but when it is appropriate that a student should be single subject or whole grade accelerated, um, it's really vital that the district and the school has a way to address that. And so I know that parents um, will come up against some challenges when trying to advocate for their child uh, to be accelerated. And again, this is regardless of label, right? Your student doesn't have to have a gift of label um, to be a student that would um, uh, be a good candidate for acceleration. And so um, that is something that should be on the table when talking about differentiation for students. And so I just wanna remind parents that yes, that should be on the table. Is acceleration an option? Um, we have tools to uh, determine whether or not students are, are a good fit for that. Um, but it is something that we should continue to talk about. Um, find out if your district has an acceleration policy. Uh, it could be more school-based. It could be, and I've run into this many times, that a, a principal has never gone through the process of acceleration um, with a student. And that's okay. And again, to come with that mindset of partnering with the school, how can we do this for the, the benefit of the, the student? Um, and then, uh, I've had some really successful cases of advocating for students to be accelerated. Um, principals who are really um, not supportive of acceleration, but after going through a process of determining that the student was a good fit, um, became very open to it and it was normalized at the school that yes, this is a possibility for students um, for to meet the needs uh, of that student. So I know that's a really um, specific advice about gifted students, but I would love for acceleration to be normalized. Thank you. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, and and if you think about it, look at the benefit to everybody involved. So in the future then as well, that, that particular school leader um, had an experience that was positive that then could carry forward uh, to benefit other students and families as well. Absolutely. Other kinds of advice for families? I, I think it's, um, boy, I feel like a lot of things I'm gonna throw out here might sound a little cliche at first, but I mean, it's important to realize that you're certainly not, you're certainly not alone. Um, and the idea that if, you, if you've got a question or you're not sure, you, you, you have to be able to ask that question um, and reach out. And um, oftentimes, um, like I said, at, at a school, that might be to an administrator um, who might put you in, the, in contact with the right person at that particular school, or it might be central district um, uh, to, to go to the office uh, that you think that uh, has the title, uh, you know, gifted education um, to be able to address that question. Um, but um, I, I do think that the questions have to be asked um, so uh, that folks on the other end have a, have, have a chance to be able to respond to those uh, questions. Um, and, um, uh, you know, Mary, you're talking about like, you know, acceleration processes. I mean, I've learned a lot just the last couple of years at the district level in terms of how, how we're handling things, how we handle acceleration maybe at some of the um, earlier grades, but what are we doing at the high school level when it's very appropriate that a student probably should be in a different math class? Um, and then if we don't have a framework to go ahead and do that, well, let's go ahead and create that framework um, with, uh, with the idea that we, we're creating a system uh, for, for other students uh, in the future as well to inform that particular decision. Um, I think where, where time allows, um, get involved. Um, and if there are certain organizations um, that, that uh, are, are, are associated with gifted education or, or CAGT or something like that, um, if, if that's something that kind of suits your personality and your, in, in your schedule to be able to do so, um, do that um, and advocate for, 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 for your child, but also for other children as well. Um, uh, but to resist the urge to say, okay, I just need to kind of handle this. Um, we just need to handle this ourselves because um, nobody else understands. Um, but I think to be able to reach out and make some type of contact and give the school a chance to respond. You know, you mentioned the, that you're not alone. And I think the value of um, shared vision and shared energy is really palpable, especially in these times. And so that even going back to that idea of legislative support mm -hmm. um, and parents having the voice to, to potentially impact that is, is really strong. Uh, Randy, were you going to? Yeah. Uh, we have a kind of a relevant question about supporting families, and we get this question a lot um, on the Facebook page itself. My kid was recently identified. 
what is an ALP and how, what's my role in it and what does it mean for my kid? I think because IEPs have so much teeth um, mm -hmm. because of federal legislation and, 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 and law, um, ALPs are kind of amoebas and they look different in different districts. And you know, the question here, um, um, Brooke asked um, a very similar question. My child just identified what should I look to for the ALP? It's different district to district. I mean, there's certain things that need to be in there, but how it functions and how it's created is sometimes um, varies. But what advice do you have about parents who are um, needing support on, on navigating the ALP process and I'd also like to mention before I forget, because it's right here, parents who are watching who want to know how to collectively advocate for their gifted child and their gifted families, please go on to our website at coloradogifted.org, find your local affiliate, contact the person in charge of that affiliate and go to a meeting. They're virtual now, so you can do it at home in your PJs. And, and really that collective advocacy, you're right, Ryan, that collective advocacy in Norma is just so important. And I think, um, one of the things, as and Meryl's brought this up, is reaching out to our families who are from those underrepresented groups and pulling, mm -hmm. bringing them into the affiliate and, and helping um, raise awareness for the inequities and increasing those identification pieces. But I think those affiliates are a great resource to kind of start with that collective advocacy. Um, and I think one of the biggest questions we get in those affiliate groups and on this page is about those ALPs. So if you guys could take a moment, I know we're kind of running out of time, but I think that's a huge question that looms all the time. Thank you. And thank you um, to um, our, our members of the audience that raised those questions. Uh, advanced learning plans. Um, and we spend time um, teaching um, our pre-service teachers at the university what those are. So pre-service teachers have a chance to really understand their role as well. Um, but I'm going to turn this to Meryl because Meryl and, and colleagues were um, going to offer a workshop on ALPs. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to you, Meryl. Yes, thanks. Um, so I just want to say a couple of things. If you're looking to get more involved also at your district level, many districts have family advisory groups. Um, maybe it's called something slightly different in other districts, but that you can uh, become a part of and um, not only have a voice in some of the decisions that are being made at the district level for gifted education, but also um, to create some connections with other parents of gifted students um, who are also, you know, going through the ALP process. So um, this is definitely a need that uh, I know all of us gifted educators see is um, that yes, you're okay, your child's identified and now what? Um, so you get your child now has an advanced learning plan from now until the end of high school. Um, the way that it looks will be slightly different uh, in secondary than elementary. However, um, and the format can be slightly different based on what district you're in. However, the, the state requires um, that students have a goal in, in their specific area of identification. Um, usually that's a subject area. It may not be. They may be identified as general intellectual ability, um, which means they can choose um, what area their goal would be in. So that would be the first question I would ask um, as a parent is just to confirm what area is my student identified in uh, so you can start having a conversation about the goal itself. It's really important that you as a family and your child are involved in the ALP process. Um, it, the state also mandates that. And so, um, you, yes, you should be asking those questions. Um, there should be some, if, if it's not a meeting, I know at the secondary level, it's, there, there can be a ton of gifted students at a school and one-on-one -on -one meeting may not happen um, as it does in elementary. But starting in elementary, you should be having a one-on-one -on -one meeting um, about what the goal is and it's collaborative. It should also be um, tailored to your students' strengths. So it's not what does your student still need to learn it, this year, it's, it's what is your student really good at, right? So if your student is identified in math, that's why their goal is in math. It shouldn't be in writing because they need help in writing. That's not the purpose of an ALP. This is a strength-based document. Um, and so your student may be identified in, in several different areas. That means they get a goal in each of those areas and they also get a social or emotional goal. Um, so again, those are all 
collaborative um, with input from all parties, the, the teacher involved, uh, you as, as a family, and also the student. Um, a really important thing to note about ALPs is that they can be changed at any time. So if you have a student who meets their goal, you set a goal in September, they meet it in October, guess what, they get a new goal. And so as a parent, that's something that you can um, that you can check in on and say, how's my student doing on this goal? And if they've met the goal, um, to ask for um, another one to be set if, if that's not already happening. Um, so while um, the IEP, there's because of the, the federal laws around an IEP are different than the state laws we have on, around an ALP, um, it's the process to update an ALP is a lot faster. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind but your child should have a new ALP every year and that you should be involved in that. And I could talk about ALPs forever. So I'm gonna <laughs> let Ryan jump in. Well, I mean, I just fill some gaps here, but I mean, that was, I, I think, uh, kind of a wonderful dissertation there on, on ALPs. I think um, I think one of the things we strive uh, for, and you really touched on uh, the high school and just in the sheer numbers um, is a term that I think we're all here familiar with, but the, the concept of like alignment, um, that the idea that the, that, that, that the goal and what's identified really kind of um, aligns with uh, scheduling, um, a lot of the conversations and progress monitoring along the way. Um, and then it comes down to, you know, what information can we really share to help develop those, those goals um, uh, along the way so that students can kind of really tailor, are they gonna write? Because oftentimes they might just write a rather compliant goal where they might just say, I'm gonna go get A's, you know? And if I'm face to face with you, we're gonna have a conversation and start digging into, okay, uh, what does that mean and why, ask why a few times, uh, but can we start with actually a process that kind of warms us up a little bit so we can kind of get beyond that. Um, and then some students jump in at the level of what I call like disruptive goals, where, I mean, they wanna create new courses at the school and they really wanna have a massive impact and they just need help kind of breaking that down. And that one goal might actually be something that might work over three or four years. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, and then really just developing kind of uh, one as, as a listener, um, to the students when they're kind of sharing um, their, their ideas for the, maybe some of their, their identification goals, but also their effective goals along the way, getting to know a lot of students rather fast. So there's some trust in that conversation. And that brings me back to the idea that where I'm really happy we're starting to kind of have these conversations at the district level to really target the transitions. Um, when students are leaving middle school to high school, um, that's an opportunity um, to really re-engage with that student on the ALP process and the family. What might, what, what, how might it be different at the high school level um, uh, logistically, but also how is that information shared out to your teachers? Um, a chance to kind of really re-engage, like I mentioned, with that ALP process um, so that it stays extremely relevant. Because um, a lot of times, I mean, right now, it, it, it's a process of kind of becoming freshman level and we're gonna re-engage with that. And then they start seeing, oh, okay, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can, okay, you know, but I like to kind of get rid of that lag time. Uh, when they first kind of come into the high school. Um, so I might have gone a little off track there, but uh, but Meryl, that was a wonderful uh, uh, and very kind of thorough response there about the HLP process in Colorado. Thank you um, both. And I want to just reinforce ALP advanced learning plan strength based goals. So for example, the social emotional goal should probably not be turn in your homework on time. Is that right? Or Yes, it should be an area that a student wants to develop yeah. um, and really that they feel like they have some strength in, yes, in the social emotional area as well and to get better at. So it's not, we wanna get out of the deficit mindset and really set goals based on where the student's strengths are. Fabulous, thank you, thank you. So we've talked about all kinds of things here, here this evening, everything from why a gifted education is important to issues to, the role of advocacy to, to um, the documents that become the, the, the uh, um, process for working with the school and the ALP to the idea of legislation um, and the need for that. Um, and maybe um, if we could take just a couple more minutes and have each of you speak to what your vision of gifted education might be. And that's a broad question and it might be based on a school or it, may, it might be based on the culture um, or some of both. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So uh, the future of gifted education would be much more equitable. We would have proportional representation um, from student demographics uh, in relation to that district, right? So if 30% of the, 
of your student population is Black or African American, then 30% of your identified gifted students are Black or African American. And this is something that um, I know districts have a focus on and it's going to be continual work, but um, if I'm thinking about future in 10 years, that we would be a lot closer to have having that proportional um, representation. Additionally, if we could get federal funding for gifted education, wouldn't that be great, right? I mean, um, maybe not all listeners know, but there is no federal funding for gifted education. Um, you know, there's the Javits grant, which is different. That is not necessarily uh, going toward a standard gifted funding per state per pupil. That's not how it works. Um, although, yes, we love the Javits grant and we want that to stay too, right? Uh, but we are lucky in Colorado. Uh, um, we are progressive in our gifted education. We really are, and I'm thankful to be here and work here. Um, but we have room to grow for sure. Um, so I would love to see a, a state requirement to have a gifted teacher at every school and to have it be a full-time teacher. And if that was funded by the state, wouldn't that be great, right? So um, there's some specific things that you can help advocate for, uh, thinking about state state level advocacy for parents. Um, we really need a, like a, a very systematic way to address gifted education, to make the steps forward that we need to make um, for equity and for civil rights. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, I, when I started thinking about this a little bit too, I, I, I immediately went to policy um, and, and the idea of continuing to kind of um, iterate at the state level um, for the, the, like what we currently have at the state level, continue to kind of learn and um, and progress at, and really kind of be thinking about the funding model across the state, even considering the idea of, of urban, suburban, and and uh, rural um, in the state of Colorado. I, I really um, would would like to see um, sorry um, would like to see a future here in gifted education where um, where families know where to go. They they know what they they know what that ALP means. Um, uh, with an identification and they know those supports that because there's someone at uh, the, the school that they can very easily reach out to and start that conversation when they've got those questions. Um, so uh, to kind of eliminate a lot of that kind of just, uh, you know, uncertainty um, where we can, but, but, you know, I, I start thinking at the, at the state level of policy and I even start wondering about, like Meryl said, you know, there's no kind of federal funding um, uh, uh, for gifted education. I do wonder about regional um, and, and uh, states nearby. Um, and uh, what type of legislation they pull um, gifted ed through, if it's unique or if it's through special education, um, and if there's an opportunity there um, to some extent to kind of uh, through regions. Um, but yeah, I just got continued to kind of, and, and continue to apply the expertise at, at the state level to kind of really help legislators make those decisions. Um, they may or may not be educators. Um, they may or may not have that background in education. And um, where are we to be part of that conversation uh, you know, just knock down some doors. Thank you. I would just um, share that um, we hope that we get to a point where gifted education is understood and valued throughout all of our communities and throughout all of our constituents. And I, I want to just thank CAG T for their uh, support in that achieving that vision as well. Randy, we'll turn it back to you. Uh, these are some of my favorite conversations with CAG T, where we just get to kind of share our passions. Um, and I feel like there's so, many, so much passion in where you guys come from, um, speaking about your areas of, of emphasis at policy, equity. These are all things that are so, so important right now. And, um, you know, I, I, I know we don't have time for a lot of questions, but I think when we talk about equity and we talk about what the pandemic um, has exposed with regard to equity across all of education. But I also think we have to, we, we, it's exposed some inequities in gifted education and the whole, they'll be fine on their own. Maybe it's exposed that they won't be fine on their own. And maybe we have to say, we really do need to serve these students. Um, and and, and in-person learning is important and the services we provide are important and they are necessary. Um, and I know Jenny Ricks commented um, something about, you know, wondering, and it, I feel like that's a whole nother um, conversation with CAG-T and I, I, we're at six o'clock and I know we all have other commitments. 
Um, and I would love to get to that, um, but we're just not gonna be able to tonight. But I really appreciate your time tonight. I know it's it's giving up valuable time and this is probably you know the 300th Zoom meeting you've had this week. Um, and hey. I think we're all, <laughs> but it's so good to just, just connect with everybody um, and Thank we appreciate you, you coming. And um, I just wanna kind of wrap up um, by inviting anybody who is with us tonight to join us again. Um, we're here every Tuesday night at five o'clock on our Facebook page. We do record all of these so you could access them on our YouTube, ch YouTube channel as well, as well as on coloradogifted.org. So please, um, I know I wanna go back and revisit some of this conversation as well. But next week we're gonna be hosting Joel McIntosh. He is the president and founder of Proof Rock Press and he's going to be joined with Dr. Todd Kettler from Baylor University to talk mm -hmm. about um, observation and behavior rating scales, which are kind of an interesting topic in gifted education. So. Um, Join us next Tuesday. Ryan, Merrill, Norma, thank you so much again. We're going to let everybody go enjoy um, an evening with their families or maybe a nice dinner or maybe another Zoom meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you so much, um, viewers, thank for you. joining us this evening as well. Thank you, thank you so much.